see everybody here today. And uh, just uh, turn in your hymnals, if you will, to 386. Brethren, we have met to worship. Let's all stand. information about the areas of ministry that our Mission Georgia <coughs> offering goes to. And uh, so I encourage you to uh, pick that up. Not only information, but there's some, some prayer some prayer requests in there, things we can be praying about um, for, for, uh, for that. For example, I just want to give you one. Uh, one of the areas of ministry that Mission Georgia often focuses on is the, the foster care ministry. Right now, there are 11,000 children um, is the number of children in foster care in the state of Georgia today, 11,000 children. And um, so the prayer needs are pray for more families in Georgia to open their homes to children in foster care. There are 400 children housed in hotels each night in foster care system. Um, so th those are some numbers and some prayer requests. So that kind of information is in here. And I encourage you to pick one up there at each entrance and uh, pray for this. Don't just pray for a day or two. Pray, pray often for these needs, these ministries that are making a difference. Um, making a real difference in the world. 
Um, so it's good to see you this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this time when we can gather and worship you. Lord, you are so worthy of our worship. You're so worthy of our praise. And Lord, we so desperately need you in every way. And Lord, we just thank you for this time together as we sing your praises, as we study your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Come read God's word to us, brother. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against the holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what they, they did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threat and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. <coughs> Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Thank you, Randy. All right, children, come on down here today. I should have worn a shirt like that with a mask. It would have been cute, wouldn't it? It would have been cute, yeah. Do you, know, do you know there are some men in the Bible that got in trouble just for helping somebody? That's crazy, isn't it? That is crazy. There were two men named Peter and John. There was a man who could not walk. He could not walk. And so they... We're, we're walking by and he wanted them to give him some money and they said we don't have any money but here's what we can do and they asked Jesus to help him to rise up and walk and Jesus healed the man and he could walk in fact it says he was leaping around and he leaped up and began to walk and was leaping and praising God for what he did well, some of the folks did not like that. That's strange, isn't it? That they wouldn't like the fact. They would like the fact that they just helped this man and they healed him. And so Peter starts talking to them, and he tells them their problem is they need to know Jesus. They didn't like that either. He told them they need to repent because they needed to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. They didn't like that. So what they do, they put him in jail. Now, what did these men die? They had done anything wrong. They helped a man get healed. They tell him about Jesus, and they put him in jail. But do you know what happened? These men just didn't give. They, they, then they told them, all right, we're going to let you get out of jail. But just don't tell anybody else about Jesus. Do you know what Peter and John did? They kept telling people about Jesus. Because that's what that's what we need to do with it as Christians. We just tell each other about Jesus. Because that's what people need to hear. But it's crazy that they put them in jail all because they helped somebody. Well, there are places in the world today, other countries, where they do the same thing. If somebody's wanting to to, to worship Jesus, 
or to tell somebody about Jesus, they might get put in jail. And I'm thankful that so far in our country, we don't have to, we don't have to worry about that. But we need to pray that we never do, and we need to pray for those countries where that happens today. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for our freedoms here, and we pray that our freedoms will remain strong and that we can continue to tell others about Jesus. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in other countries who, who are arrested simply for owning a piece of the Bible, a page of the Bible. They're arrested for for holding church meetings. They're arrested for telling someone about Jesus. And we pray that you'll be faithful and, and keep them strong. Father, we just help us to be bold and tell others about Jesus, to be bold and invite others to church because that's, that's the answer to, to our world's problems is Jesus. He's the answer and nothing else. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys.
time you've given us to worship you by giving our tithes and offerings. In Jesus Christ's holy and precious name I pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Miss Anne. So, so gorgeous, wonderful. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We are beginning a sermon series that we're calling Be the Church in a Hostile World. This is a, I think it's an, of course, every sermon series should be an important sermon sermon series. Let's just, let's just put that out there like that. Amen. But this is an important sermon series because we're living in a world that is becoming more and more hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ and as a result, hostile to the church. Amen. So we're going to get some advice from our brothers and sisters in the book of Acts about how they handled the hostile world in which they were living. So we're going to spend the next few weeks here seeing how these first century followers of Christ remained obedient to Jesus in a hostile world. Today we in Act, we're in Acts 4. We're going to focus on the prayer of the church 
in verses 23 through 31 that Randy just read. But we need to set the context for that, so we're going to go back. You see, the apostles Peter and John were facing a hostile storm of opposition. A very hostile storm. Why? Why the hostility? Because when you go in Acts chapter 3, after healing this crippled beggar, Peter began to proclaim the gospel to those who were filled with wonder and amazement at what they had just witnessed. And Peter makes it clear to them that it was not him, it was not John who healed this man, but rather it was the power of the resurrected Christ who healed this man. Then Peter called them to repent of their sins and surrender to Jesus Christ. Amen. As you might imagine, the religious leaders were not happy with Peter and John, so they had them arrested and put in jail until the next day. We see that in the first three verses of chapter 4. And the next day they bring them out of jail to question them. And look at verse 7 of chapter 4. Look at what they did. And when they set them in the midst, they inquired by what power or by what name did you do this? Two, two thoughts here. They set them in their midst. I would suggest that is a pure act, of, that is an act of pure intimidation. <laughs> Amen. They got these two followers of Jesus, they set them in the middle of all of these learned figures of authority and power, dressed in all their regal robes. This is nothing but an intimidation tactic, Amen. in my opinion. And they ask him, I'll second that, they ask him a question. By what power or by what name did you do this? And if you go back to chapter 3, Verses 12 through 16, what you see is Peter's already answered this question. Amen. In chapter 3, verse 12, beginning in verse 12, and Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at, stare at us as though by our, own, by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God... The God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, whom he decided to release him. But you denied it, the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of all. So they clearly said, Peter did two things there. He didn't just say it's by the name of Jesus. Notice what he did. He said, this <coughs> Jesus whom you killed, Amen. it's in his name Amen. that this man is walking. So then they turn around again and they ask the question about what power, about what name did you do this? They've answered this question. Here's what I think is going on. They're trying to put political pressure on Peter and John. They know the answer to this question. Peter's already answered it. They're simply trying to pressure them into backing down. They're going to pressure them into saying something different. We see a lot of that today, don't we, in our world? Amen. For example, a Christian florist refuses to make floral arrangements for a homosexual wedding, or a Christian baker refuses to make a cake for a transgender celebration, and tremendous legal pressure is put on them in an effort to get them to back down, and if they refuse, the effort is then turned to destroy their business. Amen. We see it today question is, did Peter back down? And the answer is, absolutely not. Look at, look at verses 4 through 12 of chapter 4. 8 through 12 of chapter 4. And notice a key here. 
Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he was acting not on his own power, on his own wisdom, but on the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit, said to them, ruler of people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel about that, that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is no salvation and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which they must be saved. By the way, who is this Peter? If you remember, go back a little ways, Peter was cowering at a, camp, at a fire while Jesus is under trial, isn't he? Amen. He's denying that he even knows who Peter is, I mean, who Jesus is. But something happened that something is called Pentecost. <clears throat> and he was filled with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And now nothing can stop him from telling Amen. people about Jesus. He does the same two things there. It's in the power of the name of Jesus whom you killed Amen. that he's been raised to life. Yes. Now look at what the religious leaders do next. They, they, they really thought, they really thought that with all their power, all their authority, they could intimidate Peter and John and get them to back down and to not be so vocal about Jesus. Look at verses 15 through 17. And this it says, when they commanded them, as Peter and John, to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For what a notable, for, for that notable, for that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. In other words, we can't tell people, we can't tell people that they're not seeing this man who was lame, now walking. We can't tell them that. They can see him walking. Amen. But look at verse 17. But in order that it may not spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Oh, we've got power. We've got authority. We'll tell them, don't say the word Jesus anymore. And you'll be fine. But look at verses 18 through 22. Notice Peter and John's response. So they called them in and charged them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Wow. We cannot but speak about what we've seen and heard. What have they seen and heard? They had seen Jesus dead on the cross. They had seen Jesus alive after he walked out of that tomb. Amen. And their lives were transformed by Jesus. And they said, you can order us all you want. But we can't help it. We have to tell people about Jesus. Amen. We don't have an option. Then when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Now Peter and John left there. They gathered with other believers and they prayed. And that prayer is what I want us to focus on for the next few minutes this morning. And as we spend the remainder of our time focused on that prayer, I want you to notice that they did not ask God to make the hostile opposition go away. Amen. As we look at this prayer, they never prayed for the hostile opposition to go away. Now let's be honest. If we were in that place, that'd be at the top of our prayer list, wouldn't it? Amen. 
we would be we would be just absolutely bombarding heaven with Lord you know we can be more effective witnesses if you'll just take the opposition away we can make it sound so theological but they didn't do that Amen. they didn't do that I wonder I wonder if they remembered something that Jesus said to them I wonder if they remembered those words from Jesus just before, just toward the end of his earthly ministry that's recorded in John chapter 16, verse 33. I wonder if they remember when Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. Amen. But take heart. I have overcome the world. If they remembered those words, they, they thought, this is normal. Amen. This is normal. Until the Lord calls us home, this is what it's going to be like. We're going to speak. They're going to oppose. They're going to tell us not to speak. We're still going to speak. Why? Because Jesus commanded us to. He empowered us to. Amen. And he promised us that in this world you'll have tribulation. Amen. But he also assured us that he had overcome the world. Now, let's look at their prayer in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. And may the Lord transform the way we pray as we serve him in our hostile world today. First off, I want you to notice what their prayer recognized in verses 23 through 28. This is so amazing. I don't know about you, but we can learn so much from these prayers from the Bible because I don't know about you, but when I begin to pray, if I'm not careful, my my customary way to pray is I jump right into the prayer request. I just dive right in for what I'm praying for. Amen. What we need to do is spend some time in the beginning talking to the one we're praying to. Amen. Just spending time praising and glorifying him. Amen. If you notice that the majority of their prayers focus on praise to God for who he is and for what he can do. They're just praising God. In fact, if you count the verses, five verses in this prayer are used to praise God. Only two verses are used to actually ask God for something. Amen. They spend more time praising God for who he is and what he had done than they did asking him for anything. Amen. But I want you to notice a couple of things their prayer recognized. First of all, they recognize the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Verse 24. And when they had heard it, they lifted their voices together and, and to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it. They addressed him as Sovereign Lord. That word translated Lord in this verse describes someone who has absolute rule and authority, whose power, whose control are unlimited. Then in verses 25 and 26, he quoted from Psalm chapter 2 and applied it to the crucifixion of Jesus. He says, Who through the mouth of your father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his anointed. And then in verse 27, they applied it all all of those, they applied it to all of those who came together against the Lord Jesus. Verse 27 says, For truly in this city they were gathered together against our holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So they're taking Psalm 2 and they're saying, This is what, this is what, they were do this is what God was doing and who he was using to do this. And then they answer the question in verse 28. They answer a question that wasn't asked, but it's, it's, it's there. Why did all the evil happen against Jesus? Verse 28 says, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. In other words, these, these people who thought they had all power and all authority, 
were merely puppets in the hands of God, Amen. who was sovereign, who was in control of, of the entire situation. <coughs> so they began their prayer by realizing or by recognizing that God is always in total control. Nothing happens accidentally. Nothing happens randomly because God has absolute, absolute rule and absolute authority. Amen. You see, folks, when we pray, when we pray, we, not, we need to realize God is not up in heaven wringing his hands over the situation in the world. Amen. God is not up in heaven waiting on us to tell him what's going on down here. God is waiting for us to recognize that he is sovereign, which means he is in control of everything that's going on. Amen. And everything that happens, happens because he either allows it or he causes it. Amen. But nothing surprises him because he's sovereign. Amen. This prayer also recognizes the sufficiency of God. Go back up to verse 24. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it? For them, for them, the religious leaders with their threats, their warnings, for, these, for, the, for Peter and John and these Christians of that day, the threats and warnings of the religious leaders were nothing. Amen. They were nothing. Why? Because they were trusting in God who created everything that exists just by speaking it. Amen. They were praying to, they were trusting in God for whom nothing is impossible. Amen. And they began their prayer recognizing the, the omnipotence of God and in doing so, Remind us that good theology is critical to a powerful prayer life. Mm -hmm. In other words, what we believe about God affects how we pray. Amen. If we believe that he is sovereign, that he is in control, our prayers then will lack a whole lot of panic. Amen. And will be filled with a whole lot of trust. Yes. Now I challenge us today that as we pray, Fill your prayers with trusting God no matter what's going on because he is in control. Amen. He is in control. <clears throat> you see, if we recognize that God is sovereign, that he's sufficient, we will therefore believe that nothing happens on earth that surprises him or frightens us. It may scare us crazy. Amen. <clears throat> God's not surprised by any of it. He's not surprised. Then we'll believe that everything that happens is because, he, as I said, he causes it or allows it, and he will use it to fulfill his perfect plan. Amen. That's what their prayer realized. Look at what their prayer requested now in verses 29 and 30. Notice what they did not request. I already mentioned this earlier, but notice what they did not request. They did not ask God to rain down fire on the religious leaders. Amen. If praying for the opposition to go away was number one on my prayer list, right up there with it, maybe 1A or 1B would have been raining down fire <coughs> on the ones causing the opposition. Amen. Don't you think you would have prayed that too? I believe we would have. God, if you just wipe them out, just wipe them out, everything will be okay. Amen. They also did not ask God to move them to a place where it would be easier to serve him. Amen. Be easier to serve him. When we think about when we think about what they could have prayed for and we see what they actually prayed for, 
We can learn a lot from them, can't we? Amen. We can learn a lot. What did they pray for? They prayed for boldness in their witness. Amen. In Acts 4, verse 18, the religious leaders charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Could they back up that charge? If the, if the apostles broke it, could they back it up? Could they do anything about it? Yes, they had, they had the power to imprison and severely punish those who defied their orders. So this is a threat against the very lives of those first century Christians. Do not speak. Do not teach at all in the name of Jesus. And the, the unsaid part was, if you do this, it could cost you everything you have. It could hurt you physically. It could cost you your life if you do this. Amen. So when they began to pray, they did not pray to avoid prison. They did not pray to avoid beatings. Amen. They did not pray to avoid death. Instead, they asked the Lord to give them boldness. And look at what they're wanting boldness to do. They're asking for boldness to do the very thing that got them in trouble to begin with. Amen. Boldness to teach and tell others about Jesus. Yes. Look at verse 29. And now, O oh Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They wanted every ounce of boldness God would give them. Amen. They did not pray to escape difficulty. But they prayed that they would boldly proclaim Jesus in the midst of difficulty. Amen. They were not seeking comfort. They were seeking to be obedient no matter what. Amen. They prayed for boldness. They also prayed for power in their work. They desperately wanted to be obedient. They wanted to do the work of God, but they knew that without the power of God, their efforts would be futile. So they prayed that God would do what only God could do. Look at verse 30. While they stretched out their hands, to, your hand to heal. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Amen. We must be bold enough to proclaim and live the truth of God's word in a hostile world, but wise enough to realize that our words and our actions alone cannot change anyone or anything. The power of God must fill everything we say and do. The Holy Spirit must be, we must lean on him and rely on him because it's only by his power that we can make a difference. Amen. Therefore, we should constantly pray that God will work in us and through us in an undeniable way. Amen. The last point. What their prayer received. Let me ask us all a question. Not to be answered, just out loud, just to think about. <coughs> When we, when we pray to God, do we actually expect him to answer our prayers? You ever thought about that? When we pray, do we actually expect an answer? Amen. Do we actually expect him to, 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 to do what we ask him to do? Amen. Or are we just praying so we can say, well, I prayed about it. In Acts 4, they prayed with the expectation they would receive an answer. Amen. And they received a definite response. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were praying and the place was physically shaken. This was a physical sign, 
from God that he was with them. Now, it, we cannot take this verse and say, well, if we pray really powerful prayers, God's going to shake the building. Because of this verse, that's not what it's saying. What it is saying is that if we pray with expectation, pouring our hearts out to God, and we pray with expectation that God's going to move and God's going to work, we'll get a definite response. Amen. It may not be powerful in such a way that we see it and feel it, but it'll be powerful in such a way that it transforms our hearts and lives. Amen. We should always, we should always anticipate God to move and work if we are praying, earnestly praying, and seeking God to work. Amen. But also notice they received a desired response. First. 30, continue in verse 31. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. What did they pray for? They prayed for boldness, didn't they? Amen. They prayed for boldness in speaking the word of God. What did they receive? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Amen. Wow. Boldness. <laughs> well, like the church in Acts 4, the church today, we face opposition to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let our prayer be that we will be like the church in Acts 4. Pray for boldness to proclaim the gospel and pray that God will do what only he can do. Amen. Now I want to give us some homework. And I want you to, I want you to do something. Take your bulletin or a piece of paper and think of someone who is lost. Think of someone you know who's out of, doesn't go to church anywhere, lost or unchurched, either way. Write their name down. Just write their name down. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what I, I challenge all of us to do. I want, us to, I want to challenge all of us to pray for boldness in, in just one small little area. And that is boldness to tell another person about Jesus. Amen. That is boldness to invite another person to church. Amen. You say, well, I, I, get, I get nervous when I when I even think about doing that, I understand that. So do I. But we're not doing this in our own power, are we? Amen. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's not going to let us down. Amen. And he will give us the boldness we need opportunity is there. So I challenge all of us for to just pray for boldness. Pray for boldness to invite someone to church and pray for boldness to invite someone to Jesus. Amen. You might be thinking, well, I've talked to the, I've talked to someone several times and they just won't come. Talk to them more. Amen. And here's why I say that. It takes an average of 10 invitations before you, before you invite. Uh, it takes an, an average of inviting 10 people to church before one person comes with you. Amen. An average of 10 before one agree to go. So if that person won't go, don't keep pushing them. Just go to another one. Amen. Boldness. Pray that, here's another part of the prayer. Pray that God will work in your life so much that you can't help 
but tell someone about Jesus. Amen. We'll read one last verse to you here that we read earlier. It's in Acts chapter 4. When the, when the religious leaders had their meeting, they came back, they called the disciples back, and they charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And here was Peter's response, Peter and John's response. We cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. Amen. We cannot but speak about what we've seen and heard. Pray for that such, a, such an empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen. That it takes away all nerves because you are so filled with a passion to want to tell someone about Jesus. You can't help but speak the name of Jesus to Amen. them. You can't help but invite them to church. Amen. Pray for boldness. And for specifically boldness in your life. Amen. In your life. Now, if you want to pray for everybody, pray for everybody. But don't, don't do it with this attitude. Well, I think I'm fine, but I'm going to pray for old so-and-so over here. He needs some boldness. No, if you think you're fine, that's the first indication you're not fine and you need to pray for your own heart. Amen. When we start thinking we've got it made, we got this whole thing figured out, we'll pray for everybody else but not ourselves, but we good, you need to be on your knees right then and pray for your own heart. Pray for boldness Amen. in your own heart and life. There are, there are, I guarantee you every one of us, every one of us knows people that are lost, that don't go to church. Every one of us knows people. Amen. And, and we're not playing a game. This is not, this is not just funny games. If, if somebody doesn't tell them about Jesus, if they don't surrender to Jesus as, as Savior and Lord, they're going to spend eternity in hell. Amen. And we're the ones that God is saying, you tell them. Amen. And we can come up with all kinds of excuses, can't we? But we can't get away from, we can't get away from the commands of our Lord. Amen. Can't get away from the commands of our Lord to baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them all things. Make disciples. Teach them all things. Amen. That's our commission, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's our commission. So will you pray for that boldness in your heart and in your life? Simply to do one thing. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. You say, well, I don't, I, I don't know what to say. The disciples said we cannot but speak about what we've seen and heard. Amen. May the Lord get us to the point that we are so filled with him that we cannot help but tell people what Jesus has done in our life. Amen. May, that, may, we, may we desire to get to that point. May we pray that we get to that point. We want to see this church filled. I think that's that's where it starts is in us. Amen. Having a passion, having a desire to see lost people saved, to see unchurched people in church. Amen. When we get there, we're on our way. We're on our way. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this example of Peter and John. Lord, we praise you for their boldness. We praise you for their boldness. Lord, we pray that you'll fill our hearts with boldness, our minds with boldness, so that we will lovingly tell others about Jesus. We will lovingly invite others to church, not so we can just say, yeah, I did that, I accomplished that, I got that done, because we have a passion and a love for people because we know without the gospel they're going to hell, and they need to know Jesus. Lord, give us that boldness. Yes. Give us that urgency. Yes. And may we be found faithful. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
our hymn this morning is hymn number 473, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. If you need to respond publicly, won't you come this morning as we stand and sing hymn 147, hymn 473.